Hey Bruno, how are you? Hey Mark, how's it going? Not too bad mate. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Hey, my pleasure. It's, uh, yeah, I mean I, I think the first time I saw you on stage was uh, back in 91 or 92 uh, in the UK supporting Kiss. Oh nice, that was a, fu that was a fun time wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, and that, that sort of like really got me into uh, Danger, danger at the time. I've, I've sort of been listening ever since, I guess. But oh, uh, cool! Thanks a lot. No worries. I, I love the new album. The new album is uh, is great. The Defiance. Oh, oh uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks. Today's the day of the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's. Uh, Everyone's always they're asking me if I'm excited. And I said no. I was actually more excited when it wasn't out. <laughs> I guess, I guess you live you live with the music so long, don't you, before it actually uh, hits the shelves? I think it's more of a case of uh, just the way the world is now. Like uh, I'm already getting emails from people asking me when the next one's going to be made. <laughs> like they, they, you know, it's like the minute it's out, you get maybe two weeks worth of uh, press or whatever juice, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> And then it's like, it's forgotten. And then it's like, when's the next one coming out? I'm like, well, do you realize how long it takes to make a record? <laughs> so, so when is the next one coming out? <laughs> uh, hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> nice, no, oh, cool. Boy. Uh, so, so how did it all come about, the, the Defiance? Uh, it's um, it was actually kind of uh, Serafino Perugino's way of... Uh, well, first he was trying to get a new Danger Danger record, and then when he realized that wasn't going to happen, he kind of went to Plan B. And um, I kind of wanted to do, uh, if I was going to do another Frontiers album or AOR record, whatever you want to call it, uh, I kind of wanted to go in a different direction and maybe work with some people that, you know, maybe uh, the public wouldn't think I would work with, you know, that kind of like a strange pairing or something. Mm. Try and make it unique. And uh, Serafino, and I guess the, the whole the whole crew over there at Frontiers are big Danger Danger fans, and they love, you know, the whole, you know, the party kind of AOR aggressive kind of thing that we do. And uh, they, they weren't interested in hearing anything I had to say. <laughs> They were basically saying, okay, well, if you want to do a record with us, you know, uh, uh, this is what we want. And then at first I, I kind of said, I said no, because I thought it was uh, kind of like something, you know, I was like, is anybody going to really care if I do a record with Paul? Yeah. And then the more I thought about it, um, I was like, you know what, maybe this would be cool. Maybe, you know, it would fill the void. So uh, then I called Paul up and uh, he was very excited about doing a record with me and so he kind of started, you know, he's very, he's very kind of a positive guy, and I'm, I'm, I'm not negative, but I'm more like, you know, glass is half empty kind of guy. So we kind of balance each other out, and uh, him being so positive kind of got me fired up, and then I got more excited about it, and then I, you know, Miss Rob, Rob of course wanted to be involved, and, and that's how it came together. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool, and the, you've got the whole uh, Italian spaghetti western look going on as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was kind of, yeah, oh, boy. <laughs> I can't say that that's my favorite album cover. I mean, uh, my, my idea, or actually when Paul and I discussed the album cover, we were, I, I was more under the assumption that we were going to do it, do kind of like, at least the Spaghetti Westerns that I grew up watching, where I, when I would see the covers or the posters, the, the figures or the guys that were on the poster were more like way in the background and kind of, shaded and pencil drawn as opposed to our cover which is like a, a kind of a picture that was altered you know and uh i thought it was gonna be more like a tougher kind of thing more of a like, what is that bruno i'm not sure you know that kind of thing and um i didn't really involve myself too much in the artwork because i was too busy recording and you know handling the rec record so i kind of left that up to uh, paul and uh and the artist and then you know when he first came to us with the cover i was just like oh my god there's no way i'm going with this cover this is ridiculous and we had like different outfits on it, I mean, it looked way worse than it does now <laughs> and uh so you know i kind of 
sat there and looked at it, and I was like, okay, well, I have a choice. I could either scrap this whole thing, and then I'm going to have to get involved, and then it's going to get stressful. And, and I'm like, yeah, in the end, like, does anybody even care? Yeah. You know? Like, does anybody even say, oh, well, that album cover, it really made me go buy the record. <laughs> you know? So, so oh. I kind of just left it alone. I, I made a few comments like, hey, can you put this up a little? Can you put more beards on us or something? And so that was about it. So you, you're not going to turn up on stage at the Frontiers Rock Festival and in full, <laughs> full cowboy regalia? <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no, no more watch that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> as far as the sound of the album, then, you, you sort of already hit the nail on the head. It, it is sort of, I guess, very uh, late 80s, sort of danger, dangery. I know the press release mentions that it's uh, a sort of like a harder edge version of um, Bon Jovi's New Jersey, which isn't too bad a... A sort of description, I guess. How, how do you sum up the sound? Um, I think that, you know, again, for me, the, the thing that, uh, I mean, I know we have to make an 80s style record. I know that I, I didn't really want to go back and have an 80s style production. I mm. kind of wanted to just kind of just give uh, songs with hooks, and it's kind of always what I go for. I, mm. I go for just a real aggressive sound, really kind of frantic mm. and big. And um, I didn't want it to be too, like, uh, you know, 80s meeting Washington reverb and all of that stuff. I just kind of wanted to make it exciting with different instrumentation and just make it really kind of in-your-face and aggressive. And, and you know, some people perceive that as, you know, some people say it's modern and then other people say it's really 80s. So I think yeah. it's all a matter of who's listening to it and what they get from it. Yeah, I, I, I sort of like get a bit of both, I guess. I guess it, it sort of like opens up. I mean, the production's great, and you've done a you've done a fantastic job there. Um, well, thank to, you. To me, it opens up sort of eighties, but you've got songs on there like I don't know things like the Last Kiss um, mm -hmm. that 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 do sound more modern. There's there's sort of like a lot more sort of pop creeping into to numbers like that. Yeah, I mean, we didn't really go into it kind of, uh, Paul and I, when we were writing, we didn't really kind of say, oh, well, we have to write this kind of song or that kind of song. We basically just threw ideas at each other and both agreed that whichever songs we both gravitate towards were going to be the ones that end up on the record, regardless of what style or, mm. or how they end up. And, you know, there are actually, you know, three or four songs on this record that I never thought that Paul was going to like. <laughs> when I sent him the ideas and and I was like wow you know he actually likes this one that's cool and then vice versa you know he thought the same with me yeah I mean there's, there's some great stuff on there the, the single Love and Bullets is uh, it's got a huge hook and a, a great melody and I, I sort of guess I get, I get the sort of Bon Jovi reference there um, that's the one we're um, going to be playing on a radio show so. awesome um, Steve, Steve's not writing with you on this album uh, as well, um, or drumming. Mm. Was uh, was he going to be part of that, or did, is it a clash? No, of actually, you know, again, um, getting back to the whole Serafino and Danger Danger thing, uh, Serafino has been trying to get a new Danger Danger record from us for quite some time now, and uh, um, as I said probably before, my, my philosophy on all of this, you know, on continuing to, to you know, record and write with, with bands or whatever, Danger Danger, is uh, I just, I really realize that my window's closing and uh, you know I look around and I see you know band members get dying and getting sick and mm -hmm. bands quitting and doing farewell tours and all this and I, you know I know we're not as big as some of the bands that are you know popular that uh, that have done that stuff but I realize that you know I don't have that many much more time to do this you know before someone something happens to somebody I mean I don't want to sound cryptic but it's kind of just the way it is so I just figure if we're going to bother to continue to play and tour or whatever, that we should continue to record as Danger Danger. Yeah. And I've always been the one kind of pushing to do another record, pushing to keep working, pushing to, to, to do stuff. And, you know, Steve's my partner, and obviously in Danger Danger, and my writing partner, and mm. half of the, you know, force behind, you know, the, what we do, decisions and all that. And he kind of looks at it a different way. He's looking at it more in a monetary way and kind of, he just kind of thinks that, you know, that it doesn't make sense to record music anymore because there's no money in it and because, um, 
you know, people steal it and whatever. And, it's, yeah. you know, he just feels like it's a lot of work to do and not a lot of return. And I look at it differently. I look at it more like um, I feel like when our fans or when the public, the people that follow this music, when they feel that you're stagnant and you're not moving forward, they lose interest, regardless of whether the record's good or not or uh, whether it's 80s or whether it sounds as good as the early records. I mean, again, it's just more to just keep your name out there, keep people thinking that you're moving forward, that you're not just standing there and playing the same set that you do every time you play. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I want to keep working. So, uh, Serafino's trying to get us to do a new record for quite some time, and I've asked Steve, you know, a bunch of times, a couple of times I got angry about it, you know, because I, I'm frustrated because Ted wanted to do it, and I wanted to do it, and Rob... And, you know, you're not, I'm not going to do it without Steve. You know, I could, but that, that wouldn't be Danger Danger Records. So, uh, and I also don't want to record any new Danger Danger material unless we're all excited and and, and really want to do it. I don't want to force anybody into recording or, you know, by saying, oh, I'll quit if you don't record a new record. Mm. But I'm not doing that. Not, not at this stage of the game. So Steve is really the one that he doesn't have any interest in it. And I kind of, you know, want to... You know, but uh, about a year ago, probably, I just said, you know, I'm tired of asking. I'm not going to ask him anymore. When he's ready, he'll come and ask me what he wants, and, and that's also fine. So, if Revolve was the last record that we ever recorded as a band, I'm, I'm proud of that record, and I'm okay with it. So, uh, uh, you know, it's more it's more of a question you have to ask him. But the defiance mm-hmm. thing is, uh, you know, um, when I... When I uh, agreed to do the record with with Paul and stuff, I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't even want to, you know, I figured if Steve was going to be involved, then it would really be weird, because <laughs> it would be like Danger Danger without Ted. Yeah. It's just kind of weird. And uh, I kind of wanted to just see what would happen if, if I would do it just with Paul, and, and it worked out great. Yeah, no, it did, it did. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I love uh, Revolve as well. I mean, that... Oh, thank you. I think that was 2009 now, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I know when that record was made because it was made right when my son was born. Okay. So I can't, I can't forget when he was born. <laughs> yeah. Um, just going back to the album for a, for a bit, there's, there's quite a variety on there, like you you talked about before. Everything from the, I thought the very white snakey when the lights go down, which uh, mm. I think Paul's channeling Mr. Coverdale on. Uh, <laughs> On that one. Yeah, that, he, he definitely did. <laughs> and, uh, but there's, uh, there's some other great tracks. I mean, I love the the sort of touches of nostalgia on there. The, um, Little Miss Rock and Roll, where you uh, you sort of name check John Cougar, T Rex, Buggles, uh, and of course Danger Danger as well in the in the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. The 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 going back to when the lights go down. That was something. <laughs> that was one of the tracks that I was surprised that Paul even went near because. Yeah. I figured, I said, oh, this is going to be too kind of, I don't want to say metal or blues rock or whatever, yeah. but I kind of just threw that idea at him, and then when he came back with this whole, you know, I, like you said, kind of a white snake themed you know, uh, bluesy uh, melody to the song, I was just like, wow, this is pretty cool. And uh, I, you know, I kind of was trying to steer him away from doing a lot of the, you know, kind of Coverdale licks. Hmm. But then, as I got used to the song, I was like, I was like, it sounds good. <laughs> Why mess with it, you know? And um, uh, the Little Miss Rock and Roll was the actually the first song that um, that Paul and I wrote together for this thing. And when he came to me with this whole, you know, uh, nostalgia, throwing the you know titles of the songs in the in the uh, chorus and all of that, I I didn't like it. I was right away. I was just like, oh boy. I was like, maybe we should scrap this song. Because I kind of just like listened to it, and I was going, "This sounds a little hokey to me," and contrived, and and uh, and I really, honestly thought that as we recorded more songs for the record, that that one would just get left on the pile and wouldn't make it. And then at towards the end of the record, <clears throat> Paul kept telling me that all of his friends that that, that was their favorite song. Yeah. And then even, you know, like, you know, my kid, I would be recording and he'd come down to the studio and when he would hear that song, he would, he would say, Dad, I like this song. Like, people just kind of like it. And yeah. so then I kind of just, you know, stepped away from him and I was like, well, you know what, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is something that, that people kind of dig and the whole nostalgia thing. And now I'm used to it. So now I really <laughs> like it. 
It's but just, in the beginning, yeah. in the beginning, I kind of wasn't wasn't feeling it. But now it's, it's good. It's uh, like a good fun song. It's a bit like uh, Bob Seger's uh, old time rock and roll. It's like a, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. It works well, and of course you've got the big ballads as well, which are uh, the great showpieces on the album. You see, you seem to have the knack of writing a great ballad uh, over the years. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I can't. I can't take all the credit for that. I think it's uh, a lot more Paul than me because uh, even on this record, I kind of. Um, I'm not really a ballad guy. Like I don't really go for the whole sappy love song thing. It's just not my kind of thing. And uh, I know it's a necessary evil, and you know, for the female fans and all of that. But it's not kind of. I like the, again the more up tempo, even the plotting, more heavy stuff and more just straight ahead pop and uh but you know i actually had an idea of not putting any ballads on this record and yeah yeah i said why don't we make a record with no ballads i'm like well you know it's really the song's not going to get on the radio i mean like you know uh, big time radio and um uh, I says, why don't we just make a record of all rock songs? And so, you know, then, of course, you know, we had, uh, I had some ideas for ballads. I had the, the chorus for Save Me Tonight yeah. and a lot of the music, I think, for, uh, I just had the track, actually, just an instrumental track for uh, uh, That's When uh, that's when I'll Stop Loving You. Hmm. And again, threw them up just to see it, what would happen. And then we, the Save Me Tonight went back like four or five times because we kept changing that song because we couldn't get, we had the chorus written, but we couldn't find anything that matched kind of in the verses and all that. And that was more Paul's like very gets very into that stuff. And, you know, obviously he shines on those songs because, uh, you know, it's mostly vocal driven and uh, lyric driven. And uh, and so a lot of that was him. So I, I would have to say that was definitely more him than me, those two ballads. Yeah, there's some some other. I mean, it's it's one of those albums I can I sort of play from end to end. It's uh, oh, that the, was the that was the goal. Yeah, there's <laughs> nothing there's nothing bad bad on there. I mean, um, I guess we all fall down's got more of a modern feel uh, to my ear as well, which is probably one of my favourites on there. I like that one. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I, you know that that was another song that I didn't think was going to make the record, but it, it's kind of more like stripped down. There's, there's not yeah. really that much going on with it, so we just kind of. You know, tried to come up with some cool background vocal ideas, and I love that song. Every time that comes on, and I go, oh, "Yeah, this one." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I like this song. Yeah. So you've got the uh, as well as the Frontiers Rock Festival in uh, Italy in April. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, that's just around the corner, isn't it? It's only about eight yeah, days. Next up. week. Yeah. How's uh, how, how are rehearsals going? Uh, well, we're we're rehearsing next week in Italy, and we're kind of all rehearsing separately right now. <laughs> so I'm basically just in my studio with my bass, running through the the whole set, just kind of making sure that I know my part, mm -hmm. and then checking with the other guys to make sure they the, the, they're they're rehearsing and they know what's going on. And uh, Rob, uh, uh, we're using a friend of uh, Rob's. This guy Mike Dolan is playing drums. He's a he's the drummer from some band called Clawfinger. I think they're from Sweden. All right, like, okay. a new, like a new, like a new metal band or something. I, I don't know. I've never met him, but Rob says he's amazing, so I'm I'm gonna you know trust him. And uh, so we're going to Italy early, and we're gonna rehearse in Milan for a few days before the show. Yeah. So as long as he didn't come come out with a double kick bass drum sort of setup and. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. I mean, again, with those shows, it's very. Uh, uh, you know, there's like one kid on the stage and everybody uses it and kind of configures it the way they, they like. So yeah. uh, I have no idea about this guy. I'm pr I keep calling Rob saying, if you this drummer isn't good, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you know? But he's, he's saying that everything's going well. So uh, I'm actually very excited to do this show. Uh, it, it sounds great. I mean, it must be so hard to sort of like even contemplate touring something like this as well. Are you, are you well, look, uh, looking at any other of, dates? Logistically, yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you looking at any other dates? Are you going to play anything back? Well, in the, I mean, you know, US? we got a few kind of preliminary phone calls from uh, from other kind of you know festival, AOR festival type things, but nothing's materialized as of as of now. Hmm. And uh, you know, like you know, again, uh, I mean, I'd love to go play with this thing. I mean, to me, this would be like more fun than anything. But uh, at the same time, I, I kind of getting ready. Uh, in my mind, like, this is the first time I'm actually playing a show where, you know, I look at the set list and I'm like, geez, man, there's like not a lot of songs that anybody knows. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm used to playing 
when we play these festivals, I'm used to like saying, oh, okay, well, when this song comes up, everyone's going to clap. <laughs> well, I, I have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, we're trying to mix up the set and throw in some, you know, uh, Paul Lane era, Danger Danger stuff, and even Paul Solo stuff, which we're throwing it all in the, in the set. So I have no idea what to expect, but to me, it's just like more fun because it's like the unexpected, you know, the, the unknown, rather. I don't really know what's going to happen. And uh, as far as the touring thing, I mean, I'm up for playing shows. So uh, if, if uh, someone, you know, has an idea for us to do something and it makes sense, I'm, I'm all for it. But, you know, one thing I, I'm not going to do, and of course I wouldn't even do that with Danger Danger, is I'm, you know, I'm not a young guy, so I'm not going to go, like, you know, slum it in a van uh, for for you know months and uh you know sleep in uh you know on str uh, strangers beds and all that mm. stuff and for, for you know just to play a show for 10 people yeah. so I, I can't you know i can't do that anymore so doing a festival or doing a show where we open up for somebody that's kind of makes sense where we can all get together and have some fun and again not about money but just about you know traveling like gentlemen <laughs> which is rare <laughs> these days but yeah. That's kind of what what we're looking for. So you know, maybe we'll uh, we'll get to do some other shows, or maybe we won't. But uh, um, you know, I'm definitely thinking that there's going to be a follow up to this record at some point because it's already written. So um, and we actually are under contract for one more. So uh, uh, you know, if it were me, I would start it now. Yeah. But uh, but uh, you know I'm just going to kind of let the let things settle and maybe uh, you know in the fall or something and bring it up and see where we go from there. Sounds it sounds good. Well, uh, we've had both Paul and Ted have been down under recently. Well, not recently. Oh, they, you know. right, right. Paul's coming there, right? He, he is. Yeah, he's playing the Melodic Rock Festival down in yeah. Melbourne in May, I think. So he he was over a couple of years ago, I think. So it must be something yeah. about the food or the water. No, he's, you know, he's <laughs> telling me, like, he said, to me, he's like, he, he keeps telling me, he's like, man, and he goes, the travel is brutal. And, and, and I said, well, I can imagine, you know, 24 hours on a plane or whatever it is, you know. And then he says, it's just hard because you get there and, you know, you can't really sit around for a few days. Yeah. You have to, like, get right at it. So, uh, but he, uh, you know, he's, you know, he's, he was call he called me the other day, he goes, yeah, I'm getting ready for, you know, the show. And then I also have the, the I'm getting, practicing the set for Australia. And I'm like, wow. It's yeah. pretty cool. It was one of one of my bucket list things was to come there and play, but I don't know if it's going to happen. No, I mean, I'm still the, hoping. Yeah, the only way you can really do it is sort of tag it tag it on the end of Japan because I mean it's only a short hop over from Japan. So if you get dates there, a lot of bands come over and they'll play Sydney and Melbourne on the east oh, coast. Oh man, I, you know maybe we could do that because we're uh, we're actually playing in Japan in um, October. Okay. Better, so maybe I could try and call Andrew or something and say, and, hey, you know, get us over. What was the defining moment for you in your life when you knew you were going to be a musician? Was it a particular band or an experience or just uh, something I, gradual? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I would just say, I don't know if there was a particular moment, but, you know, I have to go back to the early days when, um, you know, when I first got interested in music i mean i think when i was young a really young i was first attracted to like you know the radio and r&b stevie wonder those kind of that kind of stuff uh when i was super young you know meaning like under 10 and then i just remember you know being around people and the stones started was introduced to me and kind of uh and the beatles of course you know for my, my father would dance around in the living room listen to the beatles and but i think mainly for me it was more you know i think obviously i'm going to say kiss mm. because uh i think when i when i went to see kiss and um uh not even the first time but like the second or third time and just realized like the, just the atmosphere of the show and the way that people were reacting to the band and and I just kind of looked at them and I was like, you know, I can do this, you know, and, and it, I don't know if that was a defining moment, but mm. it was more the energy of the whole scene in the late 70s um, when I was really young that kind of just gave me the confidence. Like, I, I, you know, I was a, I was a musician, um, a classical musician, because my parents are both classical musicians. 
So I was playing the cello in the Juilliard School of Music, which is a big, mm. uh, big school, yeah. big time school of music here in New York. Mm. And I was in the pre-college program when I was nine years old. So I would be, I was playing, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and all that stuff. And I didn't really, I couldn't really connect to, to I mean, I loved the music, but I couldn't really connect to the whole kind of culture that went along with it. I thought it was a little stuffy and mm. proper. And uh, when, when I was introduced to rock music, it kind of just changed everything. And I just figured, wow, well, I can play the cello, so that means I could play the bass because it has four strings. Mm. And that means I could also play the guitar and all of that. So I, the, all, the, the whole thing, the energy of Kiss and the 70s and kind of me just having music all around me was, was really what made me say, like, I, I can do this. And mm. that's kind of what got me started. It's a great, great time for music, and of course, you got to play with Kiss. Uh, yeah, yeah, that later, was just which like wow, cool. goosebumps every day. Yeah, um, you've written some great songs over the years, both for Danger and Danger and and, and other bands as well. And I know you mm -hmm. you do a lot of uh, writing um, mm -hmm. for non rock bands. Mm -hmm. What song are you most proud of, and why? <sighs> wow, I don't know if I'm most proud of any of any song i mean um there's a few that kind of stick out uh you know obviously the um from the early danger danger days um the uh songs like don't walk away and yeah. and bang bang and then later on uh, uh even on revolve there was some songs there that i really love fugitive and mm. uh trying to think of uh other songs on the, I really like the Revolve album to me I think we was our best writing mm. as a as a team Steve and I and then uh, you know I, I, I kind of don't sit there and kind of you know I, I love some of the stuff on Dawn too the song Punching Bag always every time I hear it yeah, I, I, I hear that song and I go man that's a good song I love that album yeah, that was a great album. yeah so thanks so I mean yeah I think there's just little moments here and there where I I kind of just like everything came together and I, and I think to myself wow that was a that was a good one. I don't know if I sit there and kind of think, well, this one song is my favorite of all time, but there are moments for sure. Yeah. The, there's sort of a bit of a resurgence of melodic rock at the moment, especially in the UK and Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably been going on for a few years now. It's not really a, a big scene, but it, it's sort of growing a bit of momentum. Do you think we'll ever see another scene for rock music out there, or do you think the internet and... And downloading and everything sort of really destroyed what we what we used to have and love. Well, I, I I definitely think that the internet and the downloading and all of that has definitely destroyed a lot of I mean, just music in general. But as far as the AOR scene and 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 just rock music, I, I don't know. You know, kind of. You know, I don't want to. You know, be like a downer. But to, and when I when I look at it, it just kind of makes me sad because. You know, over time, at least over my life, every, I don't know, I would say decade or five or six years or whatever, there would always be something that would come around. It wasn't necessarily AOR, but a new style of rock music. Mm -hmm. There would always be something going on with rock music. First it was, uh, you know, the 70s rock, and then it was, it, you know, I don't want to say it was just the numbers, 80s, 90s rock, but I mean, every decade had a different style of rock, but it was always kind of, you know, there was always something going on, and now there's really nothing going on. I mean, now there's there's a couple of bands, that's, you know, kind of scraggling around, and most of the world is kind of fixated on the older bands like Guns N' Roses and <laughs> bands of that out that are still around, ACDC and all of that. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm always saying like, oh, where's the new bands? Well, who's going to bring it back? And you know, the, yeah, there's there's some bands that are coming out that make a little noise where people kind of get all excited and they're like, oh, this is the new thing. It's going to be huge, and it isn't because I don't know. I just think I think it's mainly like I don't want to sound racist or anything, but I think this is like a almost like a because the world is so much different now. Meaning like there isn't necessarily a white music and a black music and a an Asian music or whatever. It's kind of all one thing. It's all kind of mixed together. I just kind of think that years and years of of kind of Anglo America, not Americans, but Anglo white people, kind of conforming towards you know R and B and rap music and gravitating towards that 
has kind of left a huge space where you know I, you know again I don't it's, it's not about a race but I mm -hmm. kind of just think about it that way because I think that always like you know when I was a kid there it was a lot more you know race division there was a lot more race division than there is now and so white you know white music was rock and roll mm -hmm. and you know black people liked R&B and then there was of course you know people that didn't care and like both mm -hmm. but now that there's you know the lines are much more blurred it's kind of like there's just pop music and there's still some rap music yeah so i kind of go like well where's the rock music and there's not, to me there's not enough of a of a kind of banding together a rebellious nature of punk rock or whatever of people that are saying you know what i don't like this like taylor swift and you know ariana grande and all this music that's out now i want to do that you know, there's still some people doing metal and all of that, and young bands coming out doing like kind of hardcore metal and this and that. But it's, there's not enough of a groundswell for it to, to me to amount to anything. So that kind of makes me feel bad just for the you know the, the kind of the legacy of rock music. But it is what it is. So I can't you know there's not not really I can do about it than other than you know make music that I think is good and and kind of just you know hope for the best. Mm. I, I, Jeez, I think, I, think I, I, don't, I hope I didn't come off sound like a racist there <laughs> <laughs> no not, not at all I mean uh, I, I, I think you're right in the way that everything's sort of just it's so hard for me it's so hard to find good music these days because I mean I listen to a heck of a lot of it uh, doing the website but you just get overwhelmed like I'll, I'll get 200 CDs a week to listen to and you can't listen oh, yeah, to it all that's you, crazy. You just yeah, you, that's you're just overwhelmed. There's so much music out there, and there's no like the magazines that we used to read when we were kids and things like that. There's no one there telling you what the next big thing is and what you should be listening to and all that sort of thing. You've got to go out and find it yourself. And it's, that's also, I mean, that's great for for kind of indie acts or bands that probably mm. you know back in the day wouldn't have been able to get a record deal. But also, like you said. There's no one telling you what to, to what to kind of focus on or what the next big, big big next big thing is, and for me when I was growing up, it was like, you know, in my mind at least what I thought was was that you had to be really good just to even get a chance mm. to get a record deal to get a chance for people to listen to you, and now there's nobody telling you you know what's good and what's what not good so anybody can make a record. And you know, a lot of it's not good, in my opinion. A lot of so, it, a lot of it know, is when, really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you get the, you're saying 200 CDs, uh, you know, you know, when you get one out of those 200, that's good. That's pretty. That's a good week. <laughs> it is a good week. Yeah. <laughs> you I, know. I, I, I've got one this week though, and I heard the next big thing is the Defiance. Um, uh, so, someone yeah. told me that. That's uh, what the, you know the. My uh, my my son, you know, when he when he hears the defiance, he rolls his eyes and he goes, "Oh, this old music for old people." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, that's exactly what it is." Well, people are uh, but, people are living yeah. longer these days, so you'll you'll be okay for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a couple of quick questions to uh, mm -hmm. to close with. Um, if you could have been a fly on the wall for the creation of any great album, just sat there in the studio, just to see how all the magic happened, what's the one album for you? Oh, it would definitely be uh, Hysteria, yeah. Def Leppard. I mean, I mean, uh, it's funny because now when I, I mean, I, I was like huge Mutt Lang guy, and uh, you know, big fan of his, and. Um, you know, now knowing the guys in Def Leppard and just hearing all the stories and stuff, maybe it probably w wouldn't have been the record. But I mean, to me, that's just a quintessential kind of, you know, the last 50 years would be as far as production and songwriting. You can't beat it. So I would have loved to just not so much see how the songs were created, but just see how it was recorded and why it was recorded in a certain way and how things came together. So that would probably be the record. Great album. Um and the final question, the really easy one: um, What is the meaning of life? Oof. <laughs> Save the easiest one for last, huh? Yeah. That's a good question. Um. Wow, I am speechless. Um. The meaning of life. Oh, boy. 
I guess the age old uh, saying do unto others is uh, you would want them to do unto you that kind of thing just to kind of uh, try and contribute something to society and you know uh, try and leave the leave the planet in in you know as good or if not better shape than you know when, the way it was when you when you got here. I mean, I really don't know the meaning of it. You know, maybe there is no meaning. Yeah, it's a it's you know, a, it's a tough question. I've heard, heard. I go I go back and forth with that one because sometimes I think we're just kind of you know hamsters on a treadmill. Yeah. You know, and you know we don't realize it, and you know I'm not very spiritual, and, and you know I don't believe in God and all of that, and and I know a lot of people that do, of course, but I'm, I kind of think we're, you know, I come from the Big Bang theory, and you know we're kind of aliens, and we're just here, and we're trying to figure out why, and then you know there are other moments when I think there is a greater purpose, you know, greater th reason why we're here, but it's the burning question for sure. Yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, I'm sorry I didn't give you a good answer to that one. <laughs> well, that's a good answer. I mean, like yeah. uh, some people uh, seem to have practiced that one when I ask them, but uh, it, it, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've heard 400 answers to that question now, and I still don't know what the answer is. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know what? You know what? I got a good answer. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning of life is to eat as much pizza as you can. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. As long as it's That's New how I'll end it. It's got to be New York pizza, though. Not, uh, not, yeah. Not yeah. Chicago. Preferably. Preferably, <laughs> yeah. But any kind will do. <laughs> That's so cool. Thank you so uh, much for taking the time to speak to us today, Bruno. Well, I appreciate it. It's I, been fun. I think and uh, hopefully I'll get to meet you one of these uh, years. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll, tell Andrew to get us down there. I'm gonna I will. Call him I'm, I'm, tell him that we, we're going to be in Japan. That sounds good. Thanks again. All right. All right, man, Mark. Take care of yourself. Take care. Thanks, Bruno. All righty.